Well, it might have taken me a few months, but the most requested video in our comment section is finally here. Today, we cover a topic that can make or break your entire war effort, your economy. Put away your calculators and let us do the thinking for you, because in this video, we will show you how to drastically increase your productivity in Thrawn's Revenge mod for Empire War. In this video, we'll cover all aspects of a successful wartime economy. However, this is not a video on how to defend that economy. If you want a video on how to defend key structures, make sure to leave a comment. So, your economy consists of numerous things. In order to keep your war machines churning, you'll need ship crews, infrastructure, and money. The last thing to consider when building your economy is its impact on your influence. To lose your influence on a planet is an act of rebellion and will cause your units and structures to be removed from the planet's surface. While it can be extremely difficult to win with no infrastructure or money, it's impossible to survive if your citizens aren't willing to support your rule. Therefore, a strong economy is a complicated, delicately balanced machine that will deteriorate if neglected. Before we get into the nitty gritty details, first we'll explore all the options available to your empire. Planets you own will generate income weekly. Unpopulated planets like Generis will produce very little, whereas Kurasan will make you 500 weekly income as a base. Every faction will begin with a capital structure that adds a thousand to your weekly income. That capital serves as your main base as it produces additional ship crews and income every week. Your capital is not to be confused with your senate slash moth buildings. You can only have one capital structure at a time, whilst your moth palaces and senate offices are not so limited and will provide defenses and influence for that planet. Every planet can support up to two tax collection buildings. Every tax structure increases the planetary base income by 100%. By building two of these, you will increase your planetary earnings by three times its original income. The cost of these buildings, apart from the initial cash investment, is that each structure will decrease your influence over the planet by two. To maintain a peaceful occupation of an individual planet, you must keep your influence value there above three. Default influence value when you conquer a planet is five. One moth palace would increase your influence to six, meaning you can build one tax structure without fear of unrest. If your influence dips below four, you'll have a few weeks to try and remedy your situation before you're ejected from the planet. For high income planets like Entrala, it's worthwhile to invest in influence so you can tax to your maximum potential. Influence structures symbolize infrastructure projects on the planet and will increase your influence by two. This building will cost you 250 credits per week, so it only makes sense to build on planets with above 250 base income. That way you gain more in taxes than you spend on upkeep. For direct benefits to your production capability and planetary influence, local industries are a perfect investment. These industries, such as Kua Drive Yards, can only be built on their respective planets. Investing in these companies will provide significant bonuses galaxy-wide, whilst also raising your influence on the planet. As you can see here, investing in Transgal Meg Industries on Bespin will increase planetary influence by one. But the real significance of this asset is that Bulwark 1s and 2s become 30% cheaper and produced 30% faster. Not all economic buildings have an effect on your planetary influence. Mining facilities are available on certain planets and produce a flat 400 100 credits a week. Planets capable of mining are highly coveted and will have a small white mining icon visible underneath the planet on the galactic map. If you don't see any white icons under the planet, make sure to turn on the display resources button on your UI and look again. Trade ports are available on all planets, but your empire is limited to 15 ports galaxy wide. In older versions of the mod, there was no cap on trade stations, which made snowballing to victory significantly easier. Since trade ports are not abundant, you may find yourself deconstructing old trading posts to reposition them in more lucrative parts of the galaxy. Be aware, these stations require security secure hyperspace lanes in order to generate income. A stranded planet with a trade station will incur no extra income. Obviously, by these rules, you'll want trading posts on planets that are not on the front line. Frontline planets have a direct hyperspace route to enemy territory. This means the trade lane is not secure and therefore won't generate income until you have captured the hostile territory. For every secured hyperspace lane running through the trade station, you'll accumulate 50 credits weekly. A select few worlds are trade hubs and they will double your trading profits from the normal amount. 
These special planets have another white icon displayed underneath the planet. If you own a trade hub, make sure you do some trading. If you've reached your maximum amount of trade ports, you can deconstruct less profitable stations where they only have access to one or two trade routes. Suddenly, you went from an extra 100 credits weekly to 400 credits weekly. If you squeeze your economy for every last drop, it will give you a significant boost to your ability to wage war. Once you start making so much money that you're unable to spend it all, time becomes your most important currency. To prevent delays in construction, you must maintain good infrastructure. So what does that mean? In the latest Fraun's Revenge update, infrastructure is a newly introduced mechanic that helps prevent snowballing to an easy victory or defeat. Your infrastructure score is calculated by adding all of your ground structures and shipyard levels together, then you subtract by the number of unused build slots. Let's say you own two planets, Coruscant and Borlis. Coruscant has the potential to add plus 13 to your infrastructure score. This will happen when you have fully upgraded the shipyards and filled all of the ground building slots. Borlis only has the potential of raising your score by plus 7. If you left Coruscant completely undeveloped, it would lower your infrastructure score by minus 13. For every structure you build on a planet, your score will rise by 2. One for eliminating an enemy slot and one more for a new building. So, if Coruscant only had a level 1 space station, it would lower your score by minus 11. That is calculated by the number of developed slots, in this case 1, subtracted by the number of undeveloped slots, in this case 12, therefore your score is minus 11. This score is tracked galaxy-wide and can affect your empire as a whole. If your score dips below 0, all prices are doubled and production time is increased by 50%. If your score gets as low as minus 30, all prices and production time will triple. This is a massive penalty and it gives your opponents the time they need to catch up. That being said, here is how you can make your infrastructure score work for you. Firstly, we know that you must develop your planets in order to stay competitive. A good first structure would be a moth building or senate office, since every planet needs defenses and influence. A level 1 station is also helpful to deter potential invasion forces. After that, you should determine the strengths of the individual planet. Some planets do not have a base income, so tax agencies would be ineffective. Certain planets can provide bonuses if you decide to invest heavily in planetary influence. And other planets can only be used as production centers. Building multiple of the same production center, for example, four barracks on the same planet, will produce infantry in a small fraction of the time it would take a single barrack. The infrastructure mechanic will force you to be creative when developing your territory. Ignore the infrastructure and your production capabilities will be significantly stalled. Thus far, we've discussed weekly income, infrastructure and government influence. The last piece of your economy is the generation of ship crews for your navy. To assemble a fleet, you need money and manpower. Not just anyone can fulfill responsibilities of an engineer on board a Star Destroyer. Naval academies are ground structures that train 10 military-grade ship crews every week. Whilst these academies will have a moderate upkeep, this is a necessary sacrifice. Otherwise, you'd be rich, but without anyone to protect your territory. In war, money saved is money wasted. Money spent is the only way to make it useful. If you have a strong economy but a weak military, you'll paint a massive target on your back. The only alternative to building academies is to build cloning facilities. Like mining and trading worlds, planets that can support cloning are marked on the galactic map. Cloning facilities are a double-edged sword, however. While you will produce 30 crews a week and unlock a 30% discount to infantry, your time to produce said infantry will double. It's not an easy call, but theoretically you could forego naval academies if you have access to a couple of cloning facilities. The last thing that affects your economy is ship maintenance. Every ship you own will require minor upkeep costs. These can be avoided by blockading a rival planet. By maintaining a blockade, you are stealing supplies from your opponent's space station. This foregoes your need to pay and maintain these ships yourself. If an enemy does this to you, building a hypervelocity gun on the surface of the planet can chase off invaders. This is because for every week an enemy is stationed above your planet, the hypervelocity gun will shoot one ship down. So if you're going to pull this trick off yourself, be sure to know there is no HV gun on the ground of an enemy planet. 
So, the quick rundown so far. Government buildings increase influence. You must maintain good infrastructure if you don't want to get left behind. Conquering planets, then trading, taxing, and mining from them increases income. Naval academies and cloning facilities produce your manpower. Certain planets have special bonuses, and you should be aware of the maximum potential for each planet. Lastly, if you're really strapped for cash, have a fleet hold orbit above a rival planet and steal their supplies. This will reduce maintenance costs. You need all of these ingredients in balance for a successful economy, and here is how to mix them all together. Starting at the beginning of your campaign, take note of what planets are under your control and what you have available. Keep your influence at level 4 at a minimum while maximizing income. Make sure to check to see if your planets have special attributes like mining. Your early game is the most important part of the war and is the most difficult part as well. Since your build options are relatively scarce at the beginning of the game, ship crew generation can be delayed. However, once you begin to have a steady stream of naval unit production, ship crews become imperative. To expand to other territories, you'll have to maintain adequate infrastructure. You can see your current score under the resources tab on the galactic map. Failing to maintain a positive score will result in an increased build cost and time. Remember, for the early game, income is the most important thing, followed by influence. When the war is in full swing, only your shipyards and income will keep you in the game. Any structure you are missing or hole you may have in the front lines can be fixed by simply throwing money at the problem. Money builds ships, academies, defenses, and everything else in the game. To reiterate, get your money up first, but not at the cost of planetary influence dipping below four. Once you've got a stable economy, you'll need to ramp up production to win the war. You are now in the mid-game fight. By this time, your goal is to set up a continuous assembly line of ships. You will be limited by four things. The number of shipyards available, ship crews, money, and bonuses or penalties to your production speed. Penalties given to you via a lack of infrastructure can be fixed by building up on the ground and in space. This is why income is so important. Any problem can be remedied with more money. The amount of new ship crews you'll need every week is dependent on how many shipyards you have working. A single Star Destroyer requires 30 crews to operate and can be built in two weeks. If you only have one shipyard constantly producing, you must generate 15 ship crews every week to avoid delays. As you may be aware, on higher difficulties, one shipyard is not nearly enough. You must scale your ship crew production to be equal with your manufacturing capability. By the end game, you should be producing at least 50 ship crews weekly to maintain a lead. Unless you're Corey, who apparently doesn't need new ship crews to survive. Look at him seven years into the war and still only making 10 ship crews weekly. Couldn't be me. So again, in summary, never dip below 4 influence. Income is top priority. As the war develops, spend more money to ramp up production. That means build infrastructure, shipyards, and academies. Then your production will win the war, as long as you have the money to maintain it. Now that you have the basic strategy, let's apply it. Playing as Hapes Consortium in Era 1, all your planets are proximal. Whilst winning as the Hapes can be a challenge, starting as the Hapes is relatively straightforward. Whilst we could discuss strategies for attack and defense of your home planets, that'll be for another video. Right now, we're going to maximize our few planets' potential. First, we take inventory of all available assets. In the top right, we can locate the administrator heroes that will decrease build costs. Keep these heroes on the back line. The longer they work for you, the more useful they'll become. Next, notice none of your planets have special properties to help your economy. If you're looking for a territory to invade, go in the direction of special interest planets like the Wayland or Barental 4. If you're going for an early game push, you must simultaneously maximize income without sacrificing your influence. A good place to start is building a trade port on Hapes, as it's the most trade lanes out of any other planet in your territory. You can build a trade port on all of your starting planets, but as you grow, those trade stations should eventually move to more profitable areas. Remember to check your planetary base income. Relophon has the highest base income of your starting worlds, and it would be best used as a tax collection planet. All planets can sustain two taxing agencies, but they require other buildings that add up to an additional plus three influence. It could be one senate office plus an infrastructure building, or it could just be your capital, as long as it adds up to an extra plus three. If you have already built structures that increase influence, you could lower the amount you spend on that planet by building a tax agency. Now, instead of losing 350 credits a week, you only lose 50. Although you're not making a profit, you're still saving money. Take 
advantage of everything you have. Expansion is a large portion of increasing your economy. Expanding will increase your base income and will give you further options to create wealth. However, expanding your territory means growing your navy, which means more ship crews. This is where practice and risk taking comes into play. It is up to you whether you want to grow via invasions or max out your home planets before launching an offense. A word of advice is that if your enemies are at their weakest at the start of the game, an early push to secure a few more territories can make a massive difference by the time that you're in the late game. Unfortunately, building units at the beginning of the game is much more difficult. If you're going to attack, preserve what you can from your fleet. Reinforcements will take time as you don't have the economy to maintain full-scale production yet. Unless you have multiple naval academies, you'll most likely have to be patient for anything larger than a cruiser to bolster the front. Take note of my income at the start of the war, and now a few weeks later. How, you ask? Trade stations, influence, taxes, and blockades. Try not to neglect the advantage of holding orbit above enemy planets. Your starting forces alone have an upkeep of 1,100. To station them in orbit of an opponent will instantly double your first week's income. As you progress, you'll want to take advantage of the planet Charaba. There, you can invest in the Olenji Charaba Corporation for discounts and quicker manufacturing. This is only helpful if you have enough Naval Academy graduates to crew your new line of ship. Once you're in full swing, labor camps will increase your manufacturing speed. They do lower your influence by two, but if you have a surplus of ship crews, labor camps serve as a good way of turning resources into results even quicker than before. So, before you set out and become a logistical mastermind you were always meant to be, let's summarize how to maintain a wartime economy. 1. Don't lose your influence over a planet. To fight for a planet and then lose it because of neglect is a waste. Minimize all waste. This includes paying for influence raising buildings but forgetting to tax the local population. If you have a surplus of influence, spend it on taxes or labor camps. 2. Increase your weekly income. All other problems can be solved with enough income. You have multiple tools at your disposal for this. 3. Ramp up production. Logistics win or lose wars. 4. Keep building your economy as more options become available to you. And 5. Ramp up production again. This is what you've been fighting for. If your economy can sustain a massive fleet, use it. This is no time for modesty. Like every aspect of this game, economy and mastery takes time and patience. There are no right answers, just difficult choices. And that is our tips and tricks on earning more money in Empire War. What do you guys think? Do you find our suggestions helpful or did we miss anything? Let me know in the comments down below. We hope you enjoy this fan suggested topic and we're looking for what we should do next. So if there's anything you want to learn about Empire War in more detail, let me know your suggestions in the comments down below as well. Because, well, I do read them and our subscribers are quite knowledgeable when it comes to this game. But besides that guys, I've been Charlie, you've been watching X2 and I'll see you in the next video. Take care guys.